My name is Daryl Holman. Um, I spent 40 years in newspapers, uh, retired in 2013 as photo editor here at the News Gazette in Champaign. Um, in that time, I was a reporter, reporter, photographer, photographer, chief photographer, and then photo editor. Um, I was taken, uh, Yusuf earlier today had a montage where he had a Mac Plus sitting on a desk, and I was taken aback by that because that's how I discovered digital, all things digital in 1985 <laughs> at a workshop at Ohio University. Um, I do drone work because, yeah, it's interesting, it's visual, and, it's, and it can also help explain things. Um, this is supposed to be kind of an exciting thing where I did the, I, I was going to live stream the drone from outside, but it's raining as you know, and so I did a kind of a first time thing. This morning I, here we go. I flew the drone indoors. I've never flown a drone indoors, never had a call for it. But this is live streaming to Facebook, which I knew I could do, but never did because two of my Facebook friends are an FAA air traffic controller at the tower out here, and also, <laughs> and, and also an official at the flight, service, uh, the flight service district office in Springfield. So I'm a little careful about what I post. But as you can see, we did, we did a live, you, you can live stream from it. And, there's, there's the people here who were here early, and it's just, um, um, it's something you, you, you could keep in the, in the back of your toolbox for those occasions when doing a live stream from a drone would be, would be appropriate. Yes, there you are. Um, Pam came up with this, this thing, not, not your mother's drone. I've been, I went earlier to the drone thing. Um, in 2015, I got a, a Section 333, which is horribly expensive, and no one knew what, we were, what FAA was going to do with drones. Um, I spent, because no one knew, I did a year of ground school at the Aviation Institute, not a semester of ground school at the Aviation Institute. Um, but we've, I've learned since then, most of what I did was still photos to start with, But I do short pieces. This is a prevent plant piece we did for uh, Investigate Midwest. And this was driving, driving through three states looking for things where the, the weather in the spring had not allowed farmers to plant. This was a fair amount of cropland that never got planted this year. The reporting was done by Chris down here. This is a huge field in, central, in southern Illinois that just never got planted. Weeds came up and others. From northern Illinois. Nice graphic by Chris. This was in July, where water was still along the along fields alongside the Missouri River in, in mid, mid Missouri. Um, this is kind of an example of a still photo. The, the, sensor, the, the sensor discussion earlier, um, the Midwest Center has, has dropped their, has dipped their toes into sensors. We were trying to determine uh, uh, pesticide drift, uh, herbicide drift in farm fields. Well, schools wouldn't, we had some limitations, and we but we also documented where we put the, the, the sensors. And the blue dot here is where we located a sensor in a helpful person's backyard next to a school next to a cornfield. You know, we could describe this all day, but this, this simple aerial shot helps kind of put things in, in, in perspective. And uh, 
we had a story. Uh, we worked with the local NPR station. Um, the power plant over here had some coal ash ponds. This is a state park over here, and the coal ash was leaching in there. In order to understand the relationship of where these things were, we did a short, short flight. Um, the big challenge here was some eagles decided my drone was, a, was an interloper and it kept attacking the drone as I was flying. That was kind of, kind of interesting. This is a lot of what I do because a lot of, there's a lot of ag action here in central, in central Illinois. We have big fields. And um, trying to make it interesting is, is uh, helpful. This is one of the big goals is, is this where the, where the combine runs alongside the wagon and unloads. I'm much, much better at it now when, than when I first started. When I first started, my drone's carbon fiber props broke and dropped into the field somewhere, and that was exciting for a while. Uh, combines. Um, I also want to talk more. People think about drones being very high up. If you're doing video, um, drones can also replace a jib or a gimbal for doing lower action things. These are kind of straightforward drone work where you drive around, find, find people in the fields and, and, and do video. I usually ask permission. This is, kind of, this is an example of what I wanted to show you outside here. This is kind of called a reveal. I did this for one of the local nonprofits. Pull out. What I'd like to show you is um, Let me see if I can do this here. This is some software that I've, that I've discovered. Have you, any of you, how many of you fly a drone here? Anybody fly a drone? Okay. This is um, some software called Leechy um, that allows you to pre-plan a flight, which means um, I've learned after I, got, after I kind of moved all more into video than just stills, the video people like things smooth, don't they? Um, and so this way you can pre-plan it before you go out and set where you want the camera to look and then program your flight with the altitude for each, each point in the flight. You can even program multiple points of interest where the camera's gonna, so this was where the marathon was going to run, one of the sections of the mar local marathon. And the flight I planned went through, started off looking here as the runners came up here, and then circled around. And you can see, you can see where the nose is pointing. That's as the camera changes angle. And you can pre-plan all that. Then you launch the drone, tell the program to go, and the flies on autopilot. Makes it making for very smooth transitions. Um, another job I use this for, let's see. Was the mechanical engineering folks wanted, wanted to, um, saw a dramatic opening for their video about their grad school of mechanical engineering. So you can see I pre-planned, this was the point of interest. Pre-planned this flight around here. Um, because you just can't, maybe if you're 25 you can do it, but I, I can't do the motions when the controller is smooth enough to make it, make it look really good. Um, bear with me, thank you. There we go. Once, once I pre-planned that flight around the, around the engineering quad, I was able to export it into, into Google Earth, which then showed me how high, if I was gonna clear buildings. So I, so I could do a whole pre-flight thing, 
checking it out, which ended up with a shot like this for their opening of their, of their, of their recruitment video. Now, most of what I do, I, I'm sorry, uh, Gary, any, uh, this is taking longer than I thought. It seemed to go so fast to rehearsal. But, <laughs> but this is the good, we're coming up. We've come around. And then even though I had two, two safety people on the ground, students still walked in front of the drone. Mm -hmm. Headphones in, everything. <laughs> Yeah, see, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's the doors to the building there. But you see how, it, how by pre-planning it and pre-flighting it, I was able to do, you know, if you're, you're trying to illustrate something, it makes a fairly, it makes a nice cinematic um, thing. Um, I'm sorry, what? Well, if the student's in front of your drone and it's on an autopilot flight... I still had the sensors turned on. Okay. And since this was like the fifth take, <laughs> um, on the fly, I changed the program to come in past that X in the, in the, in the quad. And uh, there's also a button I can hold down which narrows the range of the sensors from 15 feet to 5 feet. And it still took, that was the best of five takes. You know, I mean, there was one where a guy walked right in front of it, and the drone just stopped and said, ah, you know. <laughs> um, I've also gotten used to the fact that after all my time in newspapers as a photographer and doing video and things there, but our biggest goal was always to have, have an image that was compelling enough to be the main image on, on A1, right? Now I'm happy with six seconds in a video. <laughs> and this is, um, um, the Bill Gates Foundation has funded some research here, and his folks came to town for a Gates Notes thing. Have you ever, any of you guys ever seen a Gates Notes? He apparently writes little, writes things that he, he likes to have a video with. Um, there was a crew here from LA and Chicago, and they needed a local drone guy, so I did it. Um, I quoted him my champagne price, only to find out later that the budget for a Gates Notes video is $20,000, and <laughs> really? <laughs> um, With growth, see my opening piece there, and then we by I get that much. I want to back up a little bit there. This is actually, I, I, they had me do some new stuff with the drone. You know, people always think about the drone needs to be up high. If you're looking for like a dolly or a jib shot, this is actually the drone on tr in tracking mode moving a little bit ahead of them as we go through this. These are two researchers. This is another drone shot. See where it came in like that. You're, you're all part of a team. I was there the entire day, shot for 20 minutes, but they were happy with what I did, so it was all good. And then we close out. Um, I wanted to show you, I don't do a lot of spot news because I'm no longer associated with the newspaper, and we don't, we don't do spot stuff at the Midwest Center. Um, but my, my friend Tracy Trumbull, who I met while, while I was still in newspapers, he was also photo director at, a newspa at the newspaper, and now he works for a TV station. But this is, this is Tracy's uh, role, and I'll just r let it, oops.
I'm going to talk over it, it's okay. One of the problems of doing spot news is these days first responders have their own drones. They have, they control the airspace. So there, it's all, you know, what you're doing is often after, you, if you're going to get there all in all, it's after the fact. And there's no point in getting in conflict with a first responder and their drone. That just, that, that's just, that's a losing proposition. This was the scene of a crime of some kind. Yeah, his, his spot news kind of ended about there, and then... Um, I also wanted to mention, in the wintertime, I, if any of you are thinking about doing, a, doing the drone thing and you get the license and all that kind of stuff, Phantom Film School, this is from a guy in South Africa. Um, he's very laid back, like a lot of these online things are. It's 100 bucks. This, I learned, even having been flying for two and a half, three years, I learned a lot from this guy about adding more cinematic techniques and using that, that Leachy program to its full advantage. And so this was a good, a good resource for me. Um, it worked pretty well. Um, okay. Um, that's what I've got. I was going to show you something here real quick. Um, my, my drone efforts include, whoops. I recently got night authorization to fly at night. I had to certify I could see these, these, these lights for, for three miles. Um, I haven't done any night work yet because I have to have two, two night qualified visual observers who, my usual visual observers, they have to pass a test. And one of the, none of them have, pa have, have, have time to take a test yet, which includes my wife. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is, um, uh, this is part of the toys you got to have for that. I'm also in the midst of, oh, let me get this off. I'm also in the midst of, probably most of you have heard that flying over people is a big no-no. 
And the only way you could fly over people up until, this, until recently was to have a tethered drone. And I had investigated tethered drone. Well, it, it fly, you replace the battery compartment with a, the unit that runs your, your power comes from a wire. Usually you're limited to 200 feet, but it's on a wire, so it can't get away. The cheapest tethered drone system is about $11,000. And I, that, I could not commercially justify that in any <laughs> way, shape, or form. But then this company called Parazero got certified this, this winter, last winter. This gizmo on top is a parachute. <laughs> Much like the parachutes some planes have. And when the motors stop on here, the parachute deploys. Now there's another gizmo back here that's a beeper and I've got to be able to control the, uh, uh, the parachute with a separate remote controller. And so um, I've got all the, all the stuff for it. I just need to write, the FAA wants me to write an um, uh, operations manual, which you know, it's probably only like 12 hours of work in that. But then I should be able to fly near people then which makes those festivals, crowds, all those kind of things possible. The system is about two grand, but that's cheaper than 11,000. And it works on the two models of drones I have now. Um, the drones I'm flying have a one inch sensor. You guys, uh, you guys, anyway, it's enough so I can do 4K video at 60p and do raw, raw, raw photo files. And you can see there's pretty good detail in most of the things up there. And that's all I got. <laughs> Unless you, I, I can answer lots of questions. Pam, did I, did I okay. <laughs> um, dr drone questions. Farmers, yes. Farmers, how do they feel when they said drones? I almost always, make sure I've talked to the farmer. Like when I'm out doing the harvest stuff, I find the guy in the truck, give him my card, say this is what I'm doing. Um, now if they were doing something illegal, I'd probably figure out some way to do it, but the farmers are all, they, most of them have better drones than I have. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a, they're usually, they're usually not, a, not, a, not a problem. I've also, of course, I, I, I've also learned through my commercial business, business to schmooze some, and I'll offer them a couple of outtakes of still photos if they, if they email me. And so it's, um, I've, I've never had to do like, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, if I, if I wanted to fly over the 3,000 head dairy, dairy farm out there, I'm not quite sure that might be something I might do, do quickly, but then I'm flying over somebody's property and I'm trespassing. And I could probably do a standoff flight, much like with the coal ash thing, I never flew over um, Ameren's property. I made sure I flew just outside Ameren's property on public land or, or farmland that the guy knew we were, was okay with it. Um, but I never trespassed over the Ameren property. So you, you can do it by doing a standoff. So, yes. So two questions. I guess that it kind of dove dovetails with Brant's. Um, does property rights have a ceiling it, at a certain at a certain elevation can you fly over or or is it similar to photography where if, if you're on a public road if you go straight up you're fair game and that's kind of how my you operate um our, we're, we're limited to 400 feet altitude which is not as far as a shotgun can reach so <laughs> so, so so well i'm just you know the the the, the, the you know i'm which, uh, well, it's, it's, you know, it's closer than that. Uh, uh, so um, it's more either being discreet or letting people know what you're doing. Um, but my, my interpretation is that I don't want to get into an argument about the rights over their, their property, but if I'm flying over a neighbor's property, and a lot of times, if I did the dairy barn, I'm betting the neighbor doesn't, isn't too keen about these 3,000 head of cattle next sticks to him. Some other things. It's just um, it's choosing your battles in that. Sure. 
Can you talk a little bit, so unrelated, can you talk a little bit about um, the certification process, like what you had, what training you had to go through to become uh, certified to do this? If you, it, um, I, I went through a little more than usual just because no one knew what was going on in 2015. So I, I went through the Aviation Institute's ground school. I was the only guy who wasn't flying a plane the, right after class. Um, but I did learn about airspace and also we got to tour the tower. So I actually know Kurt and a couple other guys in the tower here. So that's, you know, you know we're all about personal relationships. Um, and then there's a couple of good online courses I recommend for someone who wants to take the Part 107 exam. Um, the rest of it, the night authorization, it's paperwork. And it's learning to, learning to tell. It's much easier than it was. Like when I first started with the 107, the FAA wanted six months to give you a clearance to fly into space. Now, if you wanted to, I, I could show you the, the, the low, low altitude aircraft authorization system. It's an online thing. I can get authorization in seconds once I do it. Um, mind if I show you real quick? There's a, the, the FAA let this go out to private companies because we're all about privatization these days. Um, let's see. Um, This is my copy of um, when I did an aerial photo of the 1,400 member freshman class, engineering freshman class here. Um, I marked out the areas we'd be flying in, put in my times, all that, and then clicked a button that said seek authorization. And before I, you know, in seconds I got, if I met all the requirements, in seconds I got an authorization that I could print out, and also it sent notification to the tower. So this is much better than six months wait. Now, for the night authorization, I had to send all my documentation up. Um, uh, I had to include, like, the test I proposed to give my visual observers, all that kind of thing. Um, the folks with the, with the flying over people in the parachute, they've sent me a template that I just fill in my name for that part, except I have to come up with my own operations manual, which I've never written an operations manual before, so I've got to work, work on that. Um, the paperwork is much easier. Um, and it was everything else. The problem is, is people who flaunt the rules. And when it comes down to it, you have to remember, I, I, I do a lot of flying within the Class C airspace of the local airport, where uh, O'Hare is a Class B, and, and uh, Willard here is a Class C, uh, which means it has a manned tower, uh, and you know, it has a five-mile circle where there's where it's controlled airspace. Uh, I've, I've actually done uh, stills and video for the airport themselves, but the drones these days are geofenced as well, um, which means because, they're, because I, I fly with GPS, if I try to launch from the airport parking lot, it won't launch. And so DJI, which is the company I work with, I, I buy my drones from, there's actually a fly safe website where you send what you want to do to Sean in Shanghai. I'm serious, Sean is the guy who answered my email. And you send your documentation, then he sends you back this firmware that's good for three days that allows you to launch from that otherwise restricted area. And so it's, 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 it's and every, all those processes have speeded up, but it takes some, it takes some doing. And, I, and I, I hadn't planned to get into this stuff, but if it's of interest, just let me know. Um, the, what else can I tell you about drones? Um, mine are, are all, yes? How long did it take you to learn to fly your drone? You talked about the paperwork and things, but before you got to get to your flight test, your flight test, 
path seemed very smooth as you were going around, and I was just wondering how long it took you to master your controls. A while. And, uh, <laughs> but it was, I'm, I'm thankful that I started off doing stills, because stills, you put, the, you put the drone up and you take some stills. The video, video is much harder, and there's things you learn. That Phantom Film School, in addition to teaching me about some cinema, cinema techniques, showed me that in the control things here, there's some settings you can change in the gimbal. So the gimbal, instead of going like this, goes like this when you do it. And you can also, you can also tamp down. Um, there's a tripod mode on the drone that tamps down all the sticks controls. So they're just much slower and smoother. And then there's even something as simple as the, the sticks actually unscrew a ways. And the farther you unscrew them, the more sensitive you can be in how you're moving them. And this is all stuff I learned from Phantom Film School, the forums, other things. And then, but you're right. If I, if I go out and fly, if I haven't flown in several weeks and go out and fly, it's a little rough the first couple. And then it gets smoother the more, more I do it. A recent flight that I was, <clears throat> the local hospital, which has a helipad, right, uh, you can kind of see it from here, wanted a bunch of video of, of, video of it. And I work with this wonderful young producer who called, she, her company's called Five Foot Productions, which I say is false advertising because she's 11 five. I'll be five foot, 11 and a half. <laughs> uh, but um, producers always want closer, slower, closer, slower. And so you get a little nervous as that goes in. And so, um, but there's other things too. You learn more about using the, the built-in software. Like there's a tracking device, which the Ads I'll show you as it follows a runner. Well, the tracking, the, the tracking utility in there, you can also pick a sign or a part of a building, change it from active track to spotlight, and then as you fly, the gimbal will stay with that centered. And so that way, you're not having to, you know, do the, I wish I had brought the controller in here. There's two sticks, four buttons, Two, four more buttons on the bottom, and all those things do different things. And so you can get, you know, if you're only, if the gimbal then, that's the camera, is on its own, making sure it's, it, it's figured out that it needs to stay on that subject there, it makes the rest of your movements look smoother because you're not having to up raise and lower the gimbal on its own. Does that make sense? <laughs> we're, we're almost done. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Uh, what sort of weather restrictions do you have with the drones? Like what kind of wind or rain or whatever weather circumstances can they withstand? I'm pretty cautious. And um, the FAA says you need to follow your manufacturer's um, recommendations. So I don't fly below 30 degrees Fahrenheit because the batteries get a little extra cold that way. I've also learned that I don't like the results. I can fly at 15 miles an hour winds and above, but then the drone yells at me the entire time that the wind that it's flying in high winds. I mean, it really yells at me. You know, um, I like. I had a perfect month in September. I had four mile an hour wind days, and those are perfect. The requirements are: I need to have the the ceiling needs to be a thousand feet. And I need to have a three mile visibility to launch. And so um, that's usually not a problem out here in the prairie. <laughs> um, except today, it's kind of wet. Uh, winds can be gusty. I, I did a job for the Beckman Institute across the road here. And the Beckman Institute, all these buildings together, there's some really weird wind channels ha happen in there. And the Beckman Institute, much like NCSA here, has lots of stuff going on inside. So there's all kinds of radio frequency interference, which all of a sudden the drone gets close. The, 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 direct, the uh, client wanted an, an elevator shot. You know what, you know what I'm talking about? It's where you start slow at the bottom and do this nice climb and then a back away. Um, but close to the building, the drone was going, I don't like this. I don't like this. I'm not happy. <laughs> um, um, no. Uh, I just, I, I don't see the point. You'd have raindrops in the way of things. I mean, if there was some kind of spot news thing that I needed to go up for a few seconds in, in the rain, I might, but not 
as a matter, it, I'm not sure what it would accomplish. Um, and there are lots of other remote things that you can do. I, I set up remote cameras um, in all kinds of situations, but yes. So um, you mentioned that uh, at one point you said I, sometimes you're discreet about your shots. And I wondered, um, you know, I, I've found as a journalist every piece of equipment uh, depending on your sources, can be a distraction. How do you keep the drone from being a distraction? Have you come up with any techniques? Or uh, if you're at a certain height, is the noise uh, less apparent? I mean, how do you keep it so that people aren't, like, looking at the drone in some weird way? If um, on a college campus here, there's usually so much, I don't know, it, it, you're, but you're right. Um, it's something you just have to deal with. You just kind of like let people get their get it, get it out of their system a minute. Um, a lot of times, if I'm doing a job involving some terror, like for the the a quad shot, I have an orange vest, orange cones, and a clipboard. I also keep a hard hat for for drone work. If you have an orange vest, a hard hat, and a clipboard with you, nobody bothers you. <laughs> Construction sites that people think you're all an OSHA inspector. No one quite knows which, who, who you're with, and they just leave you alone. <laughs> Does that answer your question at all? I mean, that plus, it's kind of like, I, I, I was thinking about this earlier. Flying a drone is a lot like when I ride my motorcycle out, out west or something. I, I used to have to keep a, a checklist in my tank bag, because at every gas stop, everybody who once owned a motorcycle would have to come up and talk to you. So you would forget to zip something up when you took off from the gas stop. It's like with a drone, if I'm out in farm country, everybody's got a, they either have their own drone or if it has a cousin who has a drone or something and they want to talk drones and you just want to get your job done and, go, <laughs> and move on. So it's, it's a challenge. Nope, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Daryl. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you much.